we finished our simulation what ifs. Lots of changes. Let's 3D print that revised model. This is another in the series from Strategies for Deploying Virtual Representations of the Built Environment. To find out more, check out the web page. In past videos, we've looked at exporting ESPR models to Blender to gain insights into building simulation models. Of course, ESPR has worked with Radiance for more than a decade. And there's a link which shows a classic use of ESPR and Radiance. And here's another video which shows how high-resolution ESPR models and Radiance can work better to enhance our understanding of patterns of shade and shadows in thick facade buildings. With the introduction of an export to Wavefront object files for use in Blender, this also allows for enhanced use of Radiance. And there's another video which shows that process. In each of these videos, we saw a number of simulation model attributes become visible. In this video, we take it to the next stage by designing simulation models so that they can be delivered as 3D architectural models. Why would we want to do this? Firstly, many design teams find value in physical models. They are a rich source of information beyond the virtual views possible in Blender and Radiance. The second reason is quality control. There's nothing like a misalignment that you can touch as well as see to highlight glitches in a simulation model. The third reason is to clarify how elements of a building actually fit together. Snagging on site is so last century. But if conventional construction documents don't give us the clues we need to avoid impending chaos, let's try something different. And of course, simulation is where a lot of what if questions are posed and resolved. The task of a simulationist is to clearly communicate these revisions to others in the design team. It's time for simulation to get physical. There's a lot to learn, so let's get started. Printing architectural models is hardly new. I saw this one after it emerged from a seriously expensive 3D printer in 2012. It was magic! But things have moved on and I could produce something similar to that today for maybe a twentieth of the cost and using open source software. The elephant in the room, though, is the friction between simulation, CAD tools, 3D printers, and their software. Unlike virtual views, 3D printing is constrained by gravity, scale, and resolution. Let's use a small cluster of rooms to demonstrate these constraints. There are four rooms, an explicit ceiling void, and includes a range of openings and construction types. There's also a mix of entities. Printing is like watching paint dry, but occasionally a toddler comes along to complicate things. Gravity. It's hard to print in midair. Occasionally we get away with it if we're dealing with a limited span. Filament may sag and result in roof surfaces. In this model, both the suspended ceiling and the slab above the void are less than perfect, although the latter is hidden. If roughness is a problem, the software for the printer allows us to define supports. These may or may not release cleanly, so our ceilings might still be rough. An alternative is to split the model in the printing software. If we do this at the level of the ceiling and print in two parts, we get a smooth ceiling surface as well as the option for folk to look inside the model. Scale. 3D printers typically work within highly constrained volumes. The Prusa Mini I use can print up to 180 millimeters in the X, Y, and Z axis. 
Other brands might manage, say, 300 millimeter dimensions. Go larger than that, and you're starting getting into a serious capital cost. But also, as the size of the print increases, so does the time, as well as the amount of raw materials needed. And resolution. 3D printers, quote, in nanometers, with the fine detail in models, can still get lost. For example, if we want to print a 6-meter section of a building within a width of 180 millimeters, and the filament width is itself 0.4 millimeters, the smallest detail we can print is around 13 millimeters. The chipboard partition in this model and the legs and the chairs and the tables are at risk. If we preview the path of the print head for a smallish model, we see, hey, whoa, there's no partition. And there's no print furniture legs. If we increase the size of the print, then these details begin to be included in the print. We have some choices. We can create a variant of the model where we upscale some of the finer details. We could introduce alternative constructions with slightly exaggerated thickness, for example, of the plasterboard. Or we could just represent only the aggregate thickness of the facade rather than the individual layers that they are composed of. And you notice that the simulation model has a row of shading fins. For simulation, these happily float in space. In reality, one would expect some means of support, and this would actually need to be included in the simulation model for it to print. And although furniture and fittings have a role to play in thermal and visual assessments, they're problematic within 3D prints. They are likely to run up against the constraints of gravity, scale, and resolution. We could print them separately, or we could add supports within the simulation model so that they can be printed. The superset data model within simulation has more than enough information to transform the abstract wireframe images we see on the screen into solid forms. Of course, simulation models can be highly abstract, or they can be quite explicit in their representations of the built environment. So, just as we design our simulation models to address specific performance questions, in the future, we may also want to consider what our goals are for the delivery of physical representations. Mostly the thermal zones we create in ESPR follow the inside face of facades and partitions. Simulation knows the buildup of facades and thus it's possible to take the polygons in the model and extrude them for their overall thickness or even for individual material layers to capture much of their 3D form. Let's consider the third reason for a physical model, to demonstrate how building components fit together. In a historical building, it's occasionally necessary to reinforce the structure. The process has parallels with an archaeological dig, where layers are briefly exposed. In this case, the traditional acoustic treatment in the intermediate floor was found to have defects and was corrected. There was an existing simulation model, and this was upgraded to clarify the acoustic issues, the relationship between the structure and the deafening material. We used exports of waveform object files to Blender to fine-tune the simulation model. Although the architectural model was focused on a limited area, a number of new construction types needed to be introduced to reflect the complexity of the facade. The acoustic layer and the structure was made explicit at the intermediate floor as well as the ceiling, and the structure at each side, having been exposed, was then documented and added to the model. Quite a few iterations were required to get to this point. To accommodate gravity, scale, and resolution issues, it made sense to orient the print with the facade against the print bed. Locations where overhangs would be problematic were marked for additional temporary supports. Having previewed the model in Blender, we send it off to be printed. Here's the print progressing over time. 
The wave pattern there is for the solid portions of the structure around the perimeter or supports that are being created. And as the layers pass in the facade, different portions of the architectural characteristics become printed. And over a number of hours, the model slowly progresses to its finishing point. Now, on the left is a test model at a small scale that took much less time than the one on the right. But because it's small, the resolution problems came. We didn't get the flooring shown there. So that's something we should have noticed, but we corrected it in time for the final model. And here's a look from the outside. Again, we see on the right side that we've got some roughness issues because of the orientation of the printing. But the structure and the acoustics did show up quite clearly in the final print.